With Ronnie Hillman expected to be out two to three weeks, should fantasy owners be looking to pick up C.J. Anderson? Or does Monty Ball's return throw a wrench into the Broncos running back situation? And with Carson Palmer now out for the rest of the season with a torn ACL, what happens to the value of Larry Fitzgerald, Michael Floyd, and John Brown? Also, Josh Gordon is expected to rejoin the Browns next Tuesday. Should fantasy owners be looking to add him or even Adrian Peterson, who could also be back soon? I'll be answering your questions from YouTube and Twitter, and I'll give you a breakdown of some of the players who have the best remaining schedules as we head toward the playoffs this season. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. My bust of the week this week is a guy that I talked a little bit about before, and that is Jay Cutler. And Cutler throws, and that's picked off at the 30-yard line by Micah Hyde. And we're starting to see that he is creating that rapport with a Michael Rivera, and I do think that he is going to be a solid play this week against Denver. There's a touchdown pass over the middle to Michael Rivera. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I am here twice a week, every week, to answer your fantasy football questions and give you the advice that you need to win your leagues. So, it was another fun slate of games this past week with a ton of fantasy scoring, but unfortunately, we did had another tough week of injuries. And the biggest one, I think, is actually coming out of Denver, and that is the injury to running back Ronnie Hillman. Hillman suffered a mid-foot sprain, they're calling it, during that game, the uh, the blowout victory over the Oakland Raiders, which led the way then for C.J. Anderson to step in and have a monster game, both running and catching the ball. He made one of the best plays that we're going to see all season. He caught this short pass on the side that was probably like a two-yard gain. That I mean, it looked like it was going to be like a two-yard gain anyway, But then he ran over like three or four guys before juking everybody out and running all the way for a touchdown. It was like a 50-yard touchdown or something ridiculous like that. And after the game, we found out that Hillman is actually expected to be out at least two weeks with this foot sprain. We're not exactly sure what the timetable is going to be. Sprains are something that can really linger or they could be something that could, you know, get fixed fairly quickly and he could be back in two weeks. But... Because he's going to be out, we're all taking a look at this Denver running back situation as being probably the premier waiver wire acquisition spot that is currently sitting in fantasy football land. And we have to look at, obviously, C.J. Anderson, who had the big game with Ronnie Hillman being out. But Monty Ball is expected to return for this weekend's games. And I, I'm not for certain that you're looking at C.J. Anderson as being the guy who is going to get the majority of the carries out of this backfield. People don't seem to realize the fact that Monty Ball, despite the fact that he was not performing anywhere near where he thought he would, was still getting the majority of the touches for the Broncos before he got hurt. And I've said it before, but NFL teams don't typically bench players after an injury. When they get back after an injury they typically get their old job back. And that is very, very true with most teams. It's very rare that we see something like Colin Kaepernick replacing Alex Smith when he got injured. But, you know, you kind of saw the writing on the wall with that one over time. But you you look at this Denver Broncos running back situation, and I'm not for certain that we're going to see either guy get, you know, 80%, 90% of the carries. I kind of think it's going to be a little bit of a committee backfield, at least until we see what Monty Ball can do if he's back to being fully healthy or not. But CJ Anderson might be given more snaps than he otherwise would 
if you know if everybody was healthy, if Hillman was healthy and Ball, uh, obviously I'm not expecting C.J. Anderson to get you know 15 carries in that type of a scenario, but. I still think that Monty Ball is the guy that I want to own out of this backfield at the moment and possibly for the remainder of the season. I actually saw a thread on Reddit, and I will make sure that I leave a link to that in the description below, where it actually went really in-depth into exactly why this person who is a fairly smart analyzer based on what they wrote, they actually kind of broke down why Monty Ball is probably going to continue to have the job once he gets back. And I just can't disagree with the the reasoning that he had. I mean, he basically broke down that the Broncos running back situation back then when Monty Ball was running, they were basically facing, you know, seven to eight people in the box on a very regular basis. And that was largely because well, at least this person assumed that defenses were kind of testing Peyton Manning. They were saying, look, if you want to try and beat us, you can do that with the pass. We're not expecting that you're going to be able to put up the same type of numbers this year that you did last year because you don't have Eric Decker and you didn't have Wes Welker early in the year. And because of that, Hillman was facing those more more stacked boxes, I should say. I mean, he still wasn't, you know, getting Adrian Peterson stacked boxes or anything like that. But the point is, is that Ronnie Hillman was facing fewer guys in the box, which basically led to a more effective running game for the Broncos when Ronnie Hillman was out. And obviously, there's no question that Hillman was running smarter. He was running faster, stronger, and he just looked better overall than Monty Ball. But the situation was also different. It's true. It just was different. And not not only that, but this person also broke down that the offensive line was performing significantly better now than they were back when Monty Ball was getting the majority of the carries. So, You kind of look at those two situations and you basically say to yourself, okay, look, CJ Anderson has never really been given a chance. And obviously he performed in the one opportunity that he's had. And and there's something to be said for that. We can't just completely overlook it. But Monty Ball was the guy coming into the season. I mean, he was the guy who they were banking on to replace Noshan Moreno. Moreno left without really that much controversy. I mean, it's not like he got a huge deal down in Miami, and he was a top five fantasy running back last year. Now, obviously, nobody said that that Noshan Moreno was a top five skill uh, running back, but the fact that he was producing the numbers that he did just showed us that you don't necessarily need to be a top premier talented player to perform decently in an offense where you've got Peyton Manning throwing the ball for 50 plus touchdowns. I mean, the offense is just out of control, which really leaves the opportunity opportunity for other players to run for touchdowns and, you know, catch screen passes and things like that. And really, like I said, face fewer stacked boxes than many other running backs do. Now, I still think that you have to go out there and pick up a CJ Anderson, and I'm making a priority uh, to get him in my leagues where I have decent waiver wire uh, numbers for, you know, where I'm ranked. And I, I still think, like I said, that you've you've got to make sure that you try and get this guy in your roster, especially if you have a, a Ronnie Hillman or a Monty Ball or possibly both of them rostered. And I know that sucks that you want to you don't really want to hold three running backs on the same team. But until we really see what happens, I don't want to risk it. If I'm number one on the waiver wire uh, list this week, I'm probably going with C.J. Anderson unless there's a guy that's really obvious that's still out there for whatever reason, a Martavis Bryant or an Odell Beckham or, you know, something like that where, you know, how the hell is this guy still on the waiver wire type of a thing? C.J. Anderson's probably my number one guy in most leagues this week. So make sure you go out there and get him, even though, like I said, I'm fully expecting that Monty Ball will be the guy to own going forward for the remainder of the season, or at least until Ronnie Hillman comes back. And then we'll, you know, have to reanalyze what uh, what Ball has done since that point. So another thing that I kind of want to talk about as far as players to pick up off of waivers, Josh Gordon is expected to be back as soon as next Tuesday. And he will obviously rejoin the Browns' active roster. And he instantly brings some fire to an otherwise pretty dwindling offense. I mean, they've been grinding the ball. They really, really have been based off, you know, their entire offenses has been based off of 
controlling the football and not allowing the opposing offense to touch the ball. They've been grinding it out, picking up short first downs. They really don't have a deep passing game to speak of for the most part. I mean, they've had a couple of, you know, decent plays here and there, but for the most part, it's been pick up a first down, control the clock, you know, run, run the ball and just, you know, make sure that the other team doesn't have great field position. But when you've got a guy like Josh Gordon coming back, that changes everything. Suddenly Josh Gordon's on the field, and if this guy is performing even to, you know, 80% of what he did last year, he's a top 10 wide receiver. Josh Gordon last year, in your standard scoring leagues, was the number one overall fantasy football wide receiver. So, the skills are there, you know? Now, he might need to get some time back to just kind of get in the swing of things and, you know, relearn the playbook because he hasn't been able to practice with the Browns, despite the fact that he's healthy and everything. He's been suspended this whole time, and that couldn't really, really hurt his production early. So when he comes back, I'm not playing him in the first game because I want to see what he is actually able to do before I risk it. I don't want him to go out there and catch two passes for 20 yards or something like that and just burn me in a week where I need the points. But I still think that Josh Gordon is likely going to be a low to mid-end wide receiver too for the time being. Uh, Just because, like I said, we don't know what he'll do after he's had so much downtime. He hasn't been practicing with the team. We don't know if he's been even keeping himself in shape. I mean, this is a guy that we've heard has had motivational issues in the past. And we've heard, obviously, that he's a pain in the butt. So would it really be that surprising to anybody if he shows up 20 pounds heavier than he did coming into the season? And, you know, he just doesn't really look like he gives a crap about being there. It wouldn't really surprise me. But the truth is that because he has such a ridiculous upside, I mean, the guy could potentially be the number one overall wide receiver once again when he comes back. We have to obviously go out there and try and pick him up at this point. Like I said, I'm expecting that Josh Gordon will produce decent low-end to mid-level wide receiver two numbers, which makes him probably my number two guy on the waiver wire rankings this week because you want to make sure that you're the guy out there picking him up this week before he gets activated because otherwise you might have to you know not have him on your roster because somebody else out out there might go ahead and decide that they're going to pick him up on Monday of next week on their waivers you know they get a higher waiver ranking than you do and you're screwed so try and beat them to the punch and try and get Josh Gordon on your roster this week if he is not owned Like I said, he's my number two behind C.J. Anderson just because we don't know his level of conditioning or his level of chemistry with Brian Hoyer or just if he's going to be able to even play. I mean, who knows? The Browns sound like they're going to activate him, but, I mean, it's not a 100% until it happens. So another guy who is actually going to be coming back, well, it sounds like it anyway. We're not, again, we're not 100% sure on this, but Adrian Peterson could be back as soon as next week as well. Now, he's actually going to get a hearing on the the whole situation that he had with uh, the child abuse and, and that kind of thing. He did plead guilty to a misdemeanor, it sounds like, or he will plead guilty to it. I, I don't remember exactly what the situation with that is, but uh, bottom line is he's going to be given a misdemeanor charge, which is going to mean that he's going to avoid jail time, and the NFL sounds like, at least, that they are going to allow him to play, but... Technically speaking, they could still suspend him because currently he's on the exemption list. And that doesn't really mean that he is going to just be able to suddenly step back on the field for sure. Anyway, we we just don't know because the exemption list is kind of something that they haven't really explained exactly what it is. It's As I understand it, it's supposed to be kind of like a time-served type of thing for upcoming legal issues, which is why you've got a guy like Greg Hardy on the exemption list as well, the Carolina Panthers defensive end, and he is facing a similar type of situation to Peterson where he is likely going to be found guilty, it sounds like, of some sort of domestic violence, which could then lead to additional suspensions based off of that whole thing. So it's really hard to say at this point what exactly is going to happen with Adrian Peterson. The Vikings have said that they will welcome him back 
if he is allowed to play. So we have to pay close attention to what the NFL does here over the coming days and weeks as we as we kind of find out what's going on with the Adrian Peterson situation. And if he does end up getting reactivated and there's no real rumor of him being resuspended, you have to go out there and get an Adrian Peterson. Because, I mean, the running back position is one where it's a little bit easier to step back on the field and perform. We've seen it in the past. Guys who are picked up off of the, you know, basically off of the street the week before, and they step on the field and suddenly they put up 100 yards in a touchdown. And those guys are, you know, your Fozzie Whitakers of the world. And, you know, guys like that who it's like, you know, just names, basically. They're just guys that go out there and, you know, they've really got no f- place in fantasy football. They're not Adrian Peterson. Adrian Peterson, as we all know, legitimately one of the most physically skilled football players that has ever played the game. And this guy is one that I don't think there's ever been a question about his motivation, his conditioning. The guy is in insane shape. And I don't think there's any question that he's keeping himself in shape. He will be ready to get back on that football field if and when he does get the calling from the Vikings and he is able to step back onto the practice squad and get out there, relearn the playbook, and get comfortable with the offense. So I think Adrian Peterson is definitely somebody, again, that we need to go out there and pick up if he is available still in your league. But at this point, it's kind of a flyer. I mean, we don't know for certain that he's going to play, so... It's kind of it's it's kind of a hit or miss. He might play, he might not. And if he doesn't play, I mean at least he didn't really lose that much at this point by picking him up. But if he does play, he could have a pretty high value obviously. Now obviously again, if he does come back, you can pretty much drop Jarek McKinnon and Matt Asiata because they are not going to get significant enough playing time to actually be fantasy relevant. But again, Pay close attention to it. Don't make that decision until we find out more about uh, the way Peterson is going to be dealt with by the league. So the next thing that I want to do here, as we always do, is go over some fan questions. These are questions that you guys send to me either in the comment section of these YouTube videos here, the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast videos, or else you can leave them for me on Twitter, and that is, of course, at ClickwidTV. Obviously, again, keep in mind, guys, if you send me something too late, I'm not going to be able to answer it before the show goes up, but I will do my best if you send it to me in the next day or two. I will do my absolute best to answer all of your questions on the next episode, or, of course, I will respond to them on Twitter or on YouTube if I'm not going to answer them on the show. So, guys, the first question comes from at StayAwayJerk on Twitter, and he asks, Brandon LaFell has been very good the past few weeks, but should I consider benching Julio Jones or A.J. Green for him? Now, I don't think you're crazy for considering it, and that's given the fact that Brandon LaFell has been very, very good lately. Frankly, he's outscored both Julio Jones and A.J. Green over the past few weeks, but how many times... Are we going to be bit by the New England offense before we start to take our hands off the stove? I mean, the only guys in the Patriots offense who consistently put up points are named Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski. Even Julian Edelman's been inconsistent this year. Now, obviously, he's been more consistent than other players in the offense. But still, when you've got a guy getting like four catches for 40 yards, that's not particularly great, you know, and and I understand. Brandon LaFell, like I said, has put up good numbers over the past few games, but I think I said it this past week, but I actually view A.J. Green still as a buy low, and I'm actually starting to look at Julio Jones as joining him in the buy low category based off of questions like this, and I'm hearing this from multiple people who are looking for whatever reason to move Julio Jones, but look, Julio Jones had eight catches for 119 yards this past weekend against Tampa Bay. Now, I understand, obviously, Tampa Bay's terrible, but the point is that Julio is still capable of having big games like that, and I think he's more likely to have big games like that. Now, I understand Brandon LaFell's been very, very good, and he's putting up good numbers in a pretty good New England offense, but I still look at the Julio Jones situation, and I say, how much worse could it really get for Atlanta offensively? I mean, Matt Ryan is not this bad. I, I don't. I never thought that he was an elite quarterback. I mean, I always thought he was a borderline top 10 quarterback, and that's about it. And I still kind of feel that way about him. But look, Julio Jones is a top five talent at wide receiver. A.J. Green's a top five talent at wide receiver. Just because they've been struggling for their entire offense uh, for the past couple of weeks doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to remain that way. Now, 
New England is going to have those games where they put up monster points and Brandon LaFell is going to have himself a good game or two. But the problem is that it's very hard to predict when he's actually going to do that. And like I said, I still view these guys as being top five players as far as skill goes, at least at their position. And I still think both of them are top 12 or so, you know, basically wide receiver one at their position for the remainder of the season. So I'm probably going to say stick with A.J. Green and Julio Jones at least for this week. Hopefully it pans out. And if it doesn't, then maybe you consider going with a Brandon LaFell down the road if we need to. Second question comes from J24Israel at J24Israel on Twitter. And he asks, if Vernon Davis and Jordan Cameron were dropped in my league, should I pick them up? This is a 12-team league. Now, look, for Jordan Cameron, I'm going to say no, unless you have another good tight end who you can play for at least the next two weeks because he's missed the past two weeks with a concussion and he still isn't practicing this week. So I look at it like this. Is it very likely that Jordan Cameron's going to come back right away? I mean, first of all, he's probably going to miss this week again. But if we miss this week and maybe he comes back the week after, is he going to step back in and immediately going to be a top, you know, five to eight tight end? I'm not sure. I still think he'll be a tight end one, but I mean, it might be like 10 to 12. And like, if that's the case, then what's the point of having him sit on your bench for a week and just take up a roster spot? I just don't see it. I think there are other guys out there that I would rather have. Now for Vernon Davis, I think his situation's a little bit different. He's been super disappointing this year. I came into the year actually expecting Vernon Davis to be a top five tight end. And he was injured early in the year, and I was willing to dismiss his lack of success because of those injuries. But at this point, the truth is that he's just not getting targeted. He might still have a lingering injury or two. I don't know. I'm not Vernon Davis's, you know, uh, I'm not working on his on his legs. And, um, you know, I don't see him in practice every single day. So I can't give you the insider knowledge on if this guy is going to, going to get better as far as health goes or what. But I will tell you this. He's been targeted 12 times in the past three games combined. By comparison, the Raiders' Michael Rivera has been targeted 28 times in his past three games. Now, I don't know who's available on your waiver wire right now, but I will tell you that Rivera's owned in fewer than 40% of ESPN leagues. So if that's one of your leagues, I would go out there and add him easily over a Vernon Davis and certainly over a Jordan Cameron because... He's the hotter hand. He's the guy who's getting targeted a ton in this Oakland Raiders offense. And I understand the Raiders are terrible. They're probably not going to put up 100 points for the rest of the year. But, I mean, you look at it like this. If he's getting targeted eight times a game, ten times a game like he has been, it's hard to beat that from a fantasy standpoint. Even if he only catches four or five of those for 50 to 60 yards or so, if he gets into the end zone or sneaks in there once out of every two games or so, that's a solid fantasy tight end. That's a tight end one. There isn't a lot of depth at tight end. So to me, I think you want to look at other options here, and I just don't really think that Vernon Davis and Jordan Cameron are great options unless you're in a terrible situation where you've got like a Kobe Fleener or something, then, you know, maybe you go out there and pick up Vernon Davis. Other than that, I just, I, I'm not excited about him. I don't think there's anything really to be uh, optimistic about. He's just not getting targeted and their offense has been pretty bad. So to me, I'm going to go with uh, another guy, probably, like I said, a Michael Rivera and, you know, probably uh, another guy that I will talk about later in the show here. So stay tuned as far as the tight end position goes, because uh, we'll be going over somebody who has an awesome schedule for the remainder of the season. Third and final question on today's episode comes from at Brian plays mutt 24, or excuse me, Brian plays mutt 44. And he asks, I need three. Andre Johnson, Larry Fitzgerald, Mike Wallace, Odell Beckham Jr., Jordan Matthews, and Martavis Bryant. Now, normally, I don't do start sits on the first show of the week because I really want to try and get more information about the health of everybody and just make sure that all the situations are, you know, broken down before I start to give you advice on who to start for the games. But this one, I think, caught my attention because I think it's one of the ones that will allow me to go over quite a few different situations with one answer. So first thing. It, it kind of sounds crazy at first for me to say this, but I'm sitting Andre Johnson and Larry Fitzgerald right off the start. I know they're the, easily the two most well-known names on this list, but they both have QB issues coming into week 11. Both of them have a new quarterback. Ryan Mallett's going to be the quarterback for the Houston Texans. And then, of course, of course, Drew Stanton is going to be taking over for Carson Palmer for the remainder of the season. Now, I don't really know that these guys are going to have bad chemistry with the with the new quarterbacks, but we don't really know what they've done with them as far as 
playing with them in the past. I mean, have we really seen much from uh, from a Ryan Mallett? No, the guy just barely played football. So, I mean, unless these guys are practicing together all the time or something, it's going to be very it's going to be very difficult for me to be excited about Andre Johnson, who's been disappointing this year, Larry Fitzgerald, who's been disappointing this year, unless they're, you know, in a situation where they've been producing with the quarterback that they're going to be catching passes from. So, I'm not super excited about either of those guys. So, basically, now it comes down to we need three of this group. Mike Wallace, Odell Beckham Jr., Jordan Matthews, and Martavis Bryant. Mike Wallace is the highest scoring guy in the group on the year. He has actually scored in six of his nine games, and although he hasn't yet topped 100 yards, he has been a borderline top 20 wide receiver all year, which has made him a solid wide receiver too in your standard scoring leagues. Now, these other three guys are a little bit interesting because they have been putting up huge numbers lately. Odell Beckham, 19 catches for 298 yards and two touchdowns over his past three games. And this past week, he torched one of the best corners in the league, Richard Sherman, on multiple deep catches. Richard Sherman was singing praises about him after the game, talking about what a good player he is. And Eli Manning seems to have a lot of trust in Odell Beckham Jr. right now. So that's one that I'm really interested in. And I like that matchup. Um, I, I love just the fact that he's getting targeted a ton. I don't see any reason to sit Odell Beckham right now when he's this hot. Now, Jordan Matthews, this one is the most interesting of the group, I think, because Jordan Matthews was actually Mark Sanchez's favorite target this past week over Jeremy Macklin. He caught seven passes for 138 yards and two touchdowns, and he's actually averaged five receptions or more over his past you know, six, seven, eight games. It's been since week three that he's been averaging over five catches per game. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, I definitely think that you get a level of consistency from Jordan Matthews that you probably didn't expect to have. So that's something that's nice. Now, the question is, is he actually going to be Mark Sanchez's favorite target going forward over Jeremy Macklin? I don't see that. I do think that Jordan Matthews will fall behind Jeremy Macklin for the remainder of the season. But this offense is good enough that they're able to probably sustain two decent fantasy wide receivers. I'm not sure that Mark Sanchez is going to give them the opportunity to have that type of a game, the seven catches for a buck 38 and two, but I do think that he is going to still be decent enough to be able to get Jordan Matthews the ball. I like the opportunity this week if we can get him in our lineup. Last guy, Martavis Bryant. I don't see how you can bench him right now. He has been an absolute monster since being activated in week seven, six touchdowns in his four games so far and that happened this past week he was actually able to save what was otherwise a pretty mediocre blah type of game uh, with a garbage time touchdown and that's okay because we've seen him now perform in a close game a blowout win and a blowout loss so I think the fact that we're getting that full span and, and the full I guess uh, rainbow of uh, you know things that could happen for the Pittsburgh Steelers and the fact that he's performed in each of those things that tells me a lot about the type of player that he is and the way that he's being used in their offense he's not just situational he's being used all over the field and he's being targeted a ton so I love Martavis Bryant I am not benching him until he proves me otherwise Odell Beckham's been way too hot to bench and I think I'm going to go with Jordan Matthews over Mike Wallace, just because I think that the high end potential is there for Jordan Matthews to continue to put up good numbers. And I think that's the one that I'm least for certain about. I mean, I, I think it's possible that Mike Wallace could have another game where he gets 60 yards and a touchdown and maybe Jordan Matthews only gets six catches for 60 yards. And then, you know, obviously people are going to be like, well, you should have played Mike Wallace. Well, probably true, but I just don't think Mike Wallace right now has the high end potential. Like I said, he hasn't been over a hundred yards in any game this year. So he hasn't really done anything as far as like a huge game. He also hasn't had any multiple touchdown games. Now that's not to say that he's been bad by any means. He's been a really solid, like I said, wide receiver too, but just, he hasn't put up the wide receiver one numbers. So I'm going to actually, like I said, go with Jordan Matthews. Odell Beckham Jr. and Martavis Bryant this week. So I hope that helps you out. Hope that you will get some good luck this week with those players. I'm feeling pretty confident about benching Larry Fitzgerald and Andre Johnson this week, but, you know, of course, that could blow up in my face now that I say that. So, all right, guys, uh, I want to get into the final segment of today's episode, and that is something that I really, I really harp on a lot. This past week, I talked about the idea of roster consolidation, and that's basically, in a, in a quick five-second breakdown, 
it's getting better players for your starting lineup, trading away your depth for better players at the, in your starting lineup. And that's one aspect of how you can improve your team. The other way that you can improve your team is by really looking deeper into the matchups that are coming up for your players. Now, obviously, there are guys like Demarius Thomas and, uh, you know, like a Jamal Charles or a Peyton Manning who you're not going to bench pretty much no matter who they're going up against. It really doesn't matter. But when you see something like, you know, these middle level guys who maybe aren't performing quite as well. And you really want to try and acquire them when you see a good schedule coming up. So what we do is we take a look at the position that they play and we compare kind of what other players at that position have done against that defense. So starting off first, we have tight end Zach Ertz of the Philadelphia Eagles, and he has an awesome schedule coming up here for the remainder of the season. In week 11, he is at Green Bay, which is the 14th ranked defense against opposing tight ends, and that's the best defense that he plays from here on out as far as stopping opposing tight ends. Number tw In week 12, he's going to be up against Tennessee at home, and they're number 18 against tight ends. And then in weeks 13, 14, and 15, which are going to be the major weeks that you need to get into the playoffs in a lot of leagues, or in week 15, potentially be in the playoffs, you play Dallas, Seattle, and Dallas again. 30th and 29th ranked defenses against opposing tight ends. So they are absolutely atrocious at stopping tight ends. And uh, I don't see any reason that that is going to stop. These defenses are not built to stop tight ends, and they're allowing guys to go over the middle and get good yardage, get into the end zone especially, and that's hurting them on their defense. Week 16, Zach Ertz will be at Washington, which is the number 23 ranked defense against tight ends. And then if you play in week 17, he is going to be at the New York Giants, the number 27 ranked fantasy defense against opposing tight ends. Now I understand. Zach Ertz has been absolutely awful as of late, and Brent Selleck has frankly been outperforming him, but I still prefer Zach Ertz because I think the high-end potential is better with a Zach Ertz than it is for a Brent Selleck. So hopefully that helps you out. Uh, just want to give you a breakdown real quickly. Like I said, I'm, I'm not you know selling the world to get a Zach Ertz, but if he's out there on the waiver wire or if he's somebody's backup tight end and I'm hurting at tight end, if I'm in that guy's situation where I'm looking at Vernon Davis or um, – you know, if I'm looking at Vernon Davis or Jordan Cameron, I'm probably more looking at Zach Ertz than I am either of those guys. And then, of course, I would still prefer uh, Michael Rivera over either of these guys just because he's been so hot lately. And, you know, he actually still has a decent schedule coming up himself. So hopefully that helps you out at the tight end position. I know that's one of the tougher ones to look at, but it, it's definitely one where we want to look at the matchups as well. Next position that we're going to take a look at here is the wide receiver position, and we're going to Cincinnati for A.J. Green and Mohamed Sanu, the duo of wide receivers out there for the Bengals. I know it's been a brutal situation for the, Brent, the Bengals, and we talked a little bit about how disappointing A.J. Green has been over the past couple of weeks, but like I said, I view him as one of the best buy low candidates that there is right now in fantasy football, and the reason for it is because he has a ridiculously good schedule coming up here for the remainder of the year. In week 11, he is up against the New Orleans Saints, who are the 28th ranked defense against opposing wide receivers, and then he has back-to-back -back games against the worst and second worst fantasy defense against wide receivers the Houston Texans, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Atrocious defenses against wide receivers over the next few weeks. 28th, 31st, and 32nd ranked defenses. Amazing matchups here for A.J. Green and Mohamed Sanu coming up here. And if you can get them on your team for the next couple of weeks here, you could potentially put yourself into the position that you could make a run here at the end of the year, getting good numbers out of Green and Sanu here for the rest of the season. Now, in Week 14, it does get a little bit tougher. He does They do have to go to Pittsburgh, or actually, excuse me, they're at home against Pittsburgh in Week 14, which are the 16th-ranked defense, so they're only average against opposing wide receivers. And then in Week 15, they're at Cleveland, where ugh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough because Cleveland just pummeled them this past week and it's really tough to trust a team that has struggled at, at passing the ball when they're going to be up against a team that completely shut them down this past week but look if they do it over the next three weeks here if if green and sanu have good numbers against the saints the texans and the buccaneers or at least in two of those three games i think we can feel much more confident against when we have to play them against pittsburgh and cleveland cleveland's only 18th overall at stopping wide receivers, so it's not like they're spectacular. They just had a good game 
against the the Bengals. So I don't really see that as something that I'm buying into too much. I think that it's going to get better. I would be absolutely shocked if they were shut down to anything close to the level that they were in this past week's game when these teams meet again in week 15. And then in week 16, which is your championship week in most leagues, they are at home against the Denver Broncos, who are ninth against opposing wide receivers. So they are a top 10 defense, a top tier offense, or a top tier defense against wide receivers as well, which is the toughest defense that they play for the remainder of the season. However, they have actually struggled lately against opposing wide receivers. The Broncos have given up seven wide receiver touchdowns in just their past five games. So they're having some problems. They've given up a couple big games as well to opposing wide receivers. So I certainly think that it's possible that AJ Green and Mohamed Sanu still have good productive games against the Broncos. I don't see any reason why both of them couldn't get into the end zone in that game. Week 17, if you are playing, they are back at Pittsburgh. Again, the 16th ranked pass defense, so nothing special, but not a bad matchup either. So what I'm saying is that for the remainder of the season, really the only defense that you should be really worried about them playing against is the Cleveland Browns, which again, shut them down this past week. But again, they're not really spectacular against the pass overall. So I like AJ Green and Sanu. I would definitely be buying them and picking Muhammad Sanu up if for whatever reason he did get dropped in your league. Or uh, if at this point, like I said, AJ Green's probably the best buy low in fantasy football at the wide receiver position. So go out there and try and acquire him. I, I mean, I apologize in advance if it doesn't work out for you, but the numbers are here, guys. The numbers just make sense. Uh, I know Andy Dalton sucks. I get it. I talked about it this past week, but even he, I don't think, could be bad enough to make AJ Green irrelevant from here on out. I still think AJ Green's a good quality player just given the fact that he's so skilled. If Andy Dalton just throws it up and gives him a chance, he's going to put up good numbers against these awful defenses coming up here over the next couple of weeks. So let's move on to the running back position and we've got another guy who's been fairly disappointing this season, a guy who is a top five pick overall in a lot of leagues and that is Eddie Lacy of the Green Bay Packers. In week 11, he is going to be facing the Philadelphia Eagles defense, who are 17th ranked against opposing running backs. Week 12, he heads to Minnesota, 25th ranked defense against opposing running backs. In week 13, he's got New England at home, and that's the 26th ranked defense. And then Atlanta in week 14 at home, the worst run defense in the league. So over the next four weeks here, he is going to face three of the bottom seven fantasy defenses against opposing running backs. You could get some big, big numbers here from Eddie Lacy over the next couple of weeks. Obviously, there's still a pass first offense. So, you know, Eddie Lacy could have a game where he gets 10 carries and that sucks. Could happen. But again, the numbers make sense here. Other teams have done a great job of running the football against these defenses. Now, where it gets tough is week 15. Week 15, Eddie Lacy is up against the Buffalo Bills in Buffalo. Now, normally... Buffalo historically has been an awful, awful defense, but this year they are doing a great job on defense. They are third against opposing running backs. They've allowed the third fewest points to opposing running backs, so that's a pretty bad matchup, and unless Eddie Lacy starts to really tear it up over the next couple of weeks here, the next four games, like I said, great matchups for him. If we don't see some production out of him, I would definitely bench him against the Bills, but if he starts rolling and starts to get into the end zone and he's performing like a top 10 running back again, you kind of got to keep him in there even against the Bills. So, you know, again, look at the situation, find out what you can do with your team and see if Eddie Lacy makes sense given the scenario that you have. And then, of course, in week 16, he is back at Tampa Bay, the 22nd ranked defense against opposing running backs. So still a solid matchup there. And the Buccaneers are awful. They're going to be out of it by then. They're going to have, you know, nothing to play for whatsoever. And the Packers will still have something to play for most likely. So we definitely want to see Eddie Lacy in your lineup in that type of a matchup. If, again, he performs over these next couple of games and gives us something to think about or at least consider putting him back in our lineups after some disappointing games here over the past couple of weeks. Week 17 for Eddie Lacy, if you are still playing, he will be at home against Detroit. Detroit, again, one of the best defenses in the league. They're ranked 8th against running backs, but overall, they're an excellent defense, so I don't like that matchup either. It's kind of like the Bills, though. You kind of have to pay attention to how he did in the other games and see if he starts to get on a roll. So hopefully that helps you out at the running back position. Final one, and this might be the best of all of the groups here. Um, I am, uh, as, as a person who is a fan of this team, I am very excited to see this matchup. Tony Romo, 
for the Dallas Cowboys has an unbelievable matchup coming up here, uh, or string of matchups, I should say. In week 11, he is going to be able to get healthy. First of all, let's get that right on the table. Tony Romo, this past week, put up big, big numbers, had a great game, and got the win over the Jaguars at a neutral field over in the UK. And then he comes back, and he's going to have a week off this week to get healthy, to get rested, and make sure that he is in line and ready to roll for the remainder of the season. They've got some big, big games coming up here in in their attempt to win and uh, get into the playoffs. But he's going to have to do it, and he's going to probably have to be the guy who carries this team because some of these defenses are a lot better against the run than they are the pass. So here we go. In Week 11, like I said, he is on a bye. So this is actually a good time a lot of times to go out and acquire quarterbacks because people will be looking to, you know, if Tony Romo's their normal starter, they're going to have to find another quarterback this week. So maybe you can offer them somebody who's maybe a more mid-level starter. Um, I mean, I'm not going to try and say like a Ryan Tannehill or something like that, but, you know, you offer them a Russell Wilson or something like that, and you might be able to get Tony Romo in return because Russell Wilson is not going to be on a bye this week. And that's pretty enticing. You know, a guy who uh, Russell Wilson still carries that clout of being, for whatever reason, an elite fantasy quarterback. I've never viewed him as that. He's never performed that way. But uh, Tony Romo, I think, could be a good trade option for somebody who is on a bye week, uh, maybe trading him away and you acquiring Romo. Because in week 12, he starts to have this red hot matchup string here. In week 12, he is at the New York Giants, the 23rd ranked defense, already a team that he exploited. Week 13, he uh, is back home against the Philadelphia Eagles, the 29th ranked pass defense. Then in week 14, he's got the Chicago Bears at Chicago, fair enough. But look, they're the 32nd ranked defense against opposing quarterbacks right now. They're dead last. And then he's back at Philadelphia, the 29th ranked defense yet again. So 23rd, 29th. 32nd, 29th for that string coming off the bye. That is pretty nice for Tony Romo. Then in week 16, we are, when I say we, I, I, I use the Cowboys like I'm I'm on the team or something like that. I don't know. But uh, Dallas is at home against Indianapolis. Probably one of the tougher games that they're going to play all season. Definitely a losable game, but definitely one where there could be a lot of points scored. Indianapolis ranks 22nd against opposing quarterbacks, so not great. They're definitely not a top defense. Um, They're not horrible, but they're not good. And then in Week 17, if you are still playing, he has another amazing matchup at Washington, the 31st ranked defense. So the best defense that he plays from here on out is the 22nd ranked Indianapolis Colts defense. And that, again, could be a game where there's 60 60 or more points scored, uh, just given the fact that both these offenses are so good. So we love those games where it's a shootout and we get plenty of fantasy scoring out of our quarterback could have, you know, 40 attempts from Romo in that one, and it's hard for him to not perform well in that type of a scenario. So as you can imagine, this also actually bodes well for Des Bryant and even Terrence Williams, who also has have good matchups coming up against these defenses. Definitely go out there and try and acquire those guys. If you're thin at wide receiver and you're looking to find a guy who maybe could be a wide receiver three for you from here on out, Terrence Williams could definitely fill that role for you. These guys just have amazing matchups, and Romo is going to destroy some of these defenses if not all of them. Romo could realistically finish as a top five quarterback, you know, from this point through the remainder of the season. So I definitely love Romo going forward. If he stays healthy, the dude's going to put up good numbers. There's almost no way around it unless Des Bryant or something goes down. So Like I said, guys, we are going to touch a little bit more on these type of situations over the next couple of days here. On the next episode, maybe we'll get into a little bit more of some players who have some bad matchups coming up, so you could maybe trade them away for some guys that have the good matchups coming up. But that is going to do it for today's show. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you did like it, please be sure to press the like button below. If you learned something, also hit that like button. And if you're new to the channel, please be sure to press the subscribe button so that you can be updated when I put out the next episode, which again should be Friday or Saturday, and we'll give you guys the preview for week 11. If you have any questions for now, uh, as far as your lineup goes for this weekend's game, or if you're thinking about making a trade, or if you have just any general fantasy football questions, please be sure to leave those in the comments section below, or of course, you can tweet them to me at ClickwoodTV on Twitter. Thanks again for listening in. I do appreciate it. Be sure to check back on Friday or Saturday for the week 11 preview and some start-sit analysis for this weekend's games here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. (music) 